Welcome to the Beatrice Institute YouTube channel. I'm your host, Ryan McDermott. I'm a professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh and faculty director of the Beatrice Institute, an ecumenical learning and research community that supports advanced inquiry in the Christian intellectual and cultural traditions. Animated by intellectual friendship inside and outside the academy, Beatrice Institute serves all who pursue the beautiful, the true, and the good. Hi, welcome. I'm Ryan McDermott, faculty director of the Beatrice Institute and associate professor of medieval literature and culture in the English department at the University of Pittsburgh. And joining me today is Dr. Elise Ryan, uh, a scholar of early modern literature, a faculty fellow at the Beatrice Institute, who also teaches English in, at the University of Pittsburgh. So welcome, Elise. Hi, Ryan. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Um, so uh, these are uncertain times. Um, and for many of us, uh, this is genuinely a crisis. Um, many are experiencing loss of income, um, illness, dislocation. Most of our students got uprooted from their dorms in the middle of the semester, uh, grief over losing the end of the school year. I'm teaching a senior seminar and, you know, my seniors just are not going to be able to uh, have a graduation. Right. Um, uh, there's, uh, and then of course, illness, you know, I think many of us know people who um, have or have had or maybe have the coronavirus um and even death um so you're a reader of poetry um what have you been reading these days well i'm really not reading anything new i'm going back to the things that i turn to over and over again in times of tribulation and sadness and confusion in my life and so the first poem that i read a lot right now is larry levis's anastasia and sandman um, which is a 20th century poem. Levis wrote it in the 90s. And uh, I'm also reading a poem that is probably more familiar to most people, and that's Gerard Manley Hopkins's Carry and Comfort. Mm, okay. Yeah, I haven't, I've never read the, the Levis poem. Could you just kind of maybe read the beginning so I can get a feel for it? Sure. I can give you the first four lines, which really will give you a sense of the imagery of the poem and its pacing and also a little bit about the stance of the speaker. Okay. So it begins, the brow of a horse in that moment when the horse is drinking water so deeply it seems to inhale the water is holy. I refuse to explain. Those are the opening four lines and the poem goes on to, to explain. Really meditate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or not, right? Uh -huh. Explanation is overrated sometimes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but it goes on to meditate on the ways that violence and trauma can erase our sense of ourselves, uh, both our material reality and that existential sense that our experiences in the world are real, that they matter. Mm. So um, we'll have the full text of these poems in the show notes um so and if you want to read along as we talk about these poems you can uh pull those up in front of you um but uh and so the other poem the hopkins poem can you tell me a little bit about that sure well it's a sonnet uh, which hopkins is pretty well known for uh the thing i love about hopkins is he's a very loud poet. He makes use of a lot of poetic devices like alliteration. So you hear, it's a very aural experience. And the poem is itself meditating on what sounds like a dark night of the soul experience for the speaker who's being pummeled by the divine in some ways. So uh, as the title indicates, it's, it's dark. <laughs> yeah, carrying comfort as in carrying the uh, rotting flesh. Yes, the rotting flesh that is also food for other creatures, uh -huh. which I think is important uh -huh. to remember that it's what makes it grotesque is also what makes it sustenance 
to certain creatures. Uh And is this the one where he kind of uh, imagines himself as Jacob wrestling with God? I think he's alluding to that, but I don't think it's quite as straightforward. Uh, But we can talk about that later. Um, As you started off and so eloquently described, we are living in a time that many people are comparing to plague times and you're a medievalist. Yeah. So I'm wondering, what are the connections that you're starting to see between the poetry that you study and our current moment? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think these these are plague times. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so for a medievalist like me, I immediately go to uh, the Black Death, which was the first outbreak of the bubonic plague. Um, and between 1347 and 1352, it wiped out roughly 40% of the population of Europe. Um, It started in the Caspian Sea Basin uh, and moved west to the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and spread around the peripheries of the Mediterranean uh, and then up to England and from England into Northern Europe and then back east again uh, towards Russia. So it kind of just did this uh, clockwise tour of, of Europe and um, was absolutely um, devastating. Uh, so I'm, I imagine this is something you're somewhat, you, you know, you're familiar with. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, in, In 18 months in England, from 1348 to 1350, uh, about 40% of the population died, and that was even um, that was even higher uh, in certain demographics, um, up to 60%. Those numbers, they're astonishing. (laughs) They're overwhelming. And I know there was a a huge cultural impact from this. How could there not be? We have to make Mm -hmm. sense of these things. So what what is that cultural impact? What what are some of the forms of art that come out of this plague? Yeah, well, so, um, you know, the the one that I I think is most prominent that you kind of learn about, you know, if you're in a history class and you learn about the bubonic plague is is the dance of death. and uh you know even even the um ring around the rosy mm-hmm. uh like this is a dance of death um and uh but there's this whole cycle of um artistic imagery visual imagery and um and poetry uh based around this dance of death but the thing that really gets me about it is that uh the the first evidence that we have of this dance of death cycle is nearly two generations after the Black Death. Now, partly this is because um, the bubonic plague didn't just go away. Uh, It actually returned to Europe um, in about 30 waves over 200 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, plague remained, uh, remained with us, but, but I think also partly is just that, um, uh, the responses are belated. Right. Right. I think that's really important when you're going through crisis, it's difficult, if not impossible to articulate in the moment, what is happening to you. And I see a lot of resonance with my poems that I wanted to discuss today Mm -hmm. because both Anastasia and Sandman and Carrie and Comfort were published posthumously. Uh, In Levis's case, he Hmm. died unexpectedly before he could bring his poems into a collection. So his friend, Philip Levine, brought them together into the collection that we now have that's called Elegy. Mm -hmm. But both poems also speak to prior traumas. Um, The Levis poem uses Stalin's reign as a way of thinking through these existential crises. And as we already discussed a bit, the Hopkins is referring back to a prior moment in his life when he was experiencing what really could be described as despair and is identified as despair in the poem. Mm. Yeah, so it seems like the poetry 
of trauma is always coming too late. Like it comes a lifetime later. And right. um, so uh, let me um, read to you from Lydgate's uh, Dance of Death. Or actually, maybe let me just show you first mm -hmm. um, some images. So uh, yeah, so you've put this up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what what are you seeing here? Well, this is the book, right? An old book here uh, with skeletons moving people along. I see a king, I see a religious figure, uh, and I see the poetry beneath the image here, um, kind of almost as if it's two columns supporting this image of skeletons moving enfleshed people along. Yeah, right. So um, these images uh, that we're looking at here, I mean, this is actually a printed book. Um, uh, and this book was printed in 1485 um, in Paris. But, but what, what it is, is it's the, um, these are the only, uh, well, the, these images were copies of um, a cycle, a mural cycle, um, in a crypt in in Paris that it that no longer survives. Um, so this is the only evidence we have of that um, of that first uh, cycle of imagery that, as far as we know, is kind of the the beginning of the the art historical um, history of the the Dance of Death. And um, uh, and so. Uh, it, th this was made in the first quarter of the 15th century, so maybe 50, 60 years after the end of the Black Death. Um, and the mural, so it's accompanied by a poem, and the poem tells how death approaches people in various walks of life and calls them to death. Uh, so each person gets two stanzas. One stanza is death's address to that person. Uh, and the other stanza is the person's response. Um, so it's a dramatic poem, and that's why it lends itself to illustration. Uh, you, and these I, are really striking illustrations. I mean, the the skeletons almost seem happy. They have that kind of that mm -hmm. that smile that mm -hmm. <laughs> our skulls have, stripped of our our flesh. Uh, and they do appear to be dancing. The one mm -hmm. is kind of lifting his knee up. They're kind of grabbing people by the elbow uh, as they move them in and out of the frame of the, the text of the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it, you know, so what we're looking at right now is, um, well, if you go back, it sort of, it, it begins with the Pope. We actually don't have that image. That's, that's that first page is lost. Um, so the death comes first to the Pope, which is interesting, uh, then to the Cardinal, um, and then to the King. Um, and it kind of moves down the social scale from there. Um, so uh, death comes here to a professor and a middle-class businessman. But I think what's, what, what's interesting here is that like um, one of the skeletons, he has a cloak on. You know, like it's still like he's kind of like he was once living. Um, you kind of get the sense. And he even has a shovel. And we're going to see later on, uh, well, not in the images I have here, but, you know, there's a there's a laborer with a shovel. And so there's kind of the sense that um, it's a personified death, but it's also like people you knew who are coming and like drawing you back to to uh, where they're coming from. Um, so it's intimate yeah right they're reaching out and touching you uh yeah so here death comes to the abbess uh death comes to the usurer and the poor man uh and that's that's a really fascinating little image right there because we've got um a richly dressed man with a purse and he is putting coins into the hand of a partially kneeling uh you know uh rattly dressed 
poor man who's kind of in a has a facial expression of abjection. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you used that word abjection because I think that will come up later in my poems too. And I think that sense of being laid out and, and prone and reduced in these moments mm-hmm. is clearly coming forward in these imageries. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, it moves along. Um, there are, uh, in this version, a total of, um, uh, I think about 30 characters from various stations of life. Here we have a physician um, looking at a vial of piss, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is how we did epidemiology uh, in the 14th century, and, um, and the, uh, an amorous lover, And then uh, death even comes to the baby in a crib. Mm -hmm. This one is particularly poignant because it is very difficult for us to imagine death at all, full stop, but to be forced to imagine that it takes the most vulnerable, the poor man Mm -hmm. and the child, uh, that it has no discrimination is, is cruel and it's heartbreaking. Yeah, and that I, I think that's one of the central points of um, of these cycles. Which actually, depending on the cycle, I've looked at a bunch of them. They have they have a bunch of different characters. Like they don't all share the same characters. And, and the point is that um, you know there's no discrimination. Like death comes comes to everybody. Um, so in 1426, the English poet John Lydgate. Uh, was in Paris, and he encountered this mural and the poem on the ossuary wall of uh, the Holy Innocent Cemetery. And he was inspired to translate the poem into English. And um, and then uh, uh, another mural of the cycle imagery was uh, commissioned for St. Paul Cathedral. in the crypt there. And so Lydgate's English version of the poem accompanies those images. That's also lost, unfortunately, the, um, uh, that mural cycle. Um, but we do, what we do have in a couple of copies is Lydgate's poem. Um, and Lydgate uh, uh, very freely adapts the French original. Um, he adds uh, five prefatory stanzas. Uh, we're seeing the beginning of that here um, in a manuscript of the Hunt- Huntington Library. And um, uh, yeah, so what, tell us what, you're, what, what, what we're seeing here. So I'm seeing the manuscript. I'm seeing the colored capitals. And then I moved on to the next slide with the two stanzas uh, where death is coming for the amorous gentlewoman. So I see the opening lines of death calling out to her and his capital is in blue. And then her response, her stanza of response to death, her capital is in red. And those two primary colors, uh, cold, death, a warm life, Mm. uh, we associate them already still with these ideas of death and heart's blood and, and vivaciousness in life. And I think it's really beautiful the way that the person who wrote this incorporated the sense of color imagery onto the page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. So right here it's saying death is uh, coming to the amorous gentlewoman. I'll read, I'll read uh, maybe a couple of the, the two stanzas in Middle English and then Great. Uh, We can look at. So, death says, Come forth, my stress of Yairus, young and grain, which hold yourself of beauty sovereign, as far as ye was some team polisain, Penelope, and Queen Elaine. Yet on this dance, thy went in both twine, and so shall ye for all your strangeness. Doch danger, 
Long in Louvre hath lad you reign. Arrested is your change of double noss. And then she responds, Oh, cruel death that sparest non astat to old and young, thou art indifferent to me beauty, thou hast decide check mot. So hasty is the mortal judgment, for in me youth this was mean and untaunt. To me service, many a man to allured, but she is folly shortly in sentiment that in her beauty is too much assured. That was beautiful. Thank you. So, you know, uh, this is one of my favorite because <laughs> we see we see the beautiful woman. I mean, I don't think that. Uh, this engraving is actually showing a very beautiful woman, but uh, we're supposed to think <laughs> think of that. And she's supposed to look young, you know, she's young, she's beautiful uh, in the flower of youth. Um, and death says, checkmate. Right. I love that line, checkmate. Uh, it's so playful. It's death is dancing, uh, checkmate, I beat you at this game. Uh, the gaming dynamic is fascinating to me. Yeah, and 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 uh, you know what this is alluding to is a, um, a bunch of different versions of of a poem that's uh, that's an allegory of love, according to mm -hmm. chess. So it's the chess of love, right. and that's what she's. Well, of course, about. yeah. As an early modernist, I feel compelled to remind us all that uh, Miranda and Ferdinand are caught playing chess once they finally get together <laughs> in yes. the tempest so it's a it's a long it, that trope has a long history so <laughs> yeah yep uh, yeah so um uh what what gets me here though is that i mean there's some variation in these stanzas um in these characters but you know a lot of this is one of the most unique of the stanzas. Most of them use uh, share a lot of the same rhyme words, um, and the same thing happens over and over and over again. Um, you know, and as we saw in the imagery, you know, there's some variation in in dress, but uh, in posture, but like the images are fairly similar. In fact, I was looking through a. a um, a book of ours that has the dance of death in miniatures in the um, in the margins, and as I was uh, looking through the thumbnails um, of the the images last night, like I couldn't even tell the difference between each of the images until I like really zoomed in, uh, wow. because it's basically the same thing over and over and over again. And so one of the thing that, things that things um, that gets me about this is that uh you know I, in uh people who study trauma and the experience of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder um note that one characteristic of the traumatic experience and the processing of trauma is repetition um there is uh repetition um happens in lieu of uh, coherent narrative. Um, and, and so this seems to me to evince um, a response to an iterative pattern, uh, an experience that's, that's just an experience of the iterative, like the repeated pattern of people dying. Um, and it just happens again and again and again. You can kind of become inured to it. Um, and that's that's somehow a way in, in this poetry and in the imagery to work through that trauma. Right. Well, I think that's one thing that poetry can give us at a moment like this. Lyric poetry in particular 
isn't necessarily concerned with a clear narrative arc. You know, you and I were joking earlier with that line from Levis, I refuse to explain. And then I, I said, you know, explanation is overrated. And sometimes it is. Sometimes we can't always explain in terms of cause and effect or point A to point B to point mm -hmm. C. And what you're discussing with trauma, it's iterative capacity, that repetition or repetition with a difference is sometimes the way we talk about it. Uh, it comes together in a way in poetry and poetry's formal devices can sometimes get at that in a way that our drive toward being rational can't always do. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, there's a great, I, um, uh, I read a, an excellent article on, on Lydgate's dance of death from 2015 by a scholar named R.D. Perry, um, that looks at not only, um, the, the trauma of plague, but especially the trauma of wartime and, and, and points out that Lydgate, um, is, uh, is writing his poem in the midst of the Hundred Years' War, uh, and he's in Paris because he's there uh, with the conquering uh, um, occupation army of England. Uh, so there's, you know, there's um, there's this sense that uh, it's hard to make narrative out of death, out of trauma, out of wartime, and so uh, what right. you get instead is a kind of repetition. Right. I am thinking about repetition. I'm really moved by the ways in which Lidget was writing this poem to images, which I, that's something I think about a lot, but we don't have those images anymore. As you said, the, the, what he saw in Paris and then what was supposed to be uh, in England are not lost to us. And that yeah. tension between what is lost and unrecoverable and that which survives that really vibrates that's really where we are that's where we live between managing our losses and sometimes managing to survive them nonetheless and if you're comfortable with it this might be a good leap into levis actually yeah yeah okay. definitely um he's very concerned with this issue of what is real how do things stop being real and what, do, what starts to happen when the losses start to erode our sense of reality and how do we survive? So I was hoping that you might read the stanza before the break here. Um, this is about 20 lines after the opening that I recited earlier, but I think it's a turning point in the poem. Ooh, I love that image too. That's really beautiful. Yes, this is a great love of mine, Franz Mark, who was Kandinsky's friend, and he and Kandinsky and Gabriel Munter started a group called Der Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider group. It was an artist collective, oh, yeah. but yeah. He's so this known is a, it looks like a, a print, a wood print of mm -hmm. um, horses at rest. Uh, a, a, a one horse taking up the center of the frame and then three others kind of in the margins around him. Uh, yes. Washes yeah. of blue and green. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, from Anastasia and the Sandman. In Romania, after the war, Stalin confiscated the horses that had been used to work the fields. You won't need horses now, Stalin said, cupping his hand to his ear. Can't you hear the tractors coming in the distance? I hear them already. Thank you. I think this is one of the most terrifying gestures of poetry. Mm -hmm. Stalin cupping his hand to the ear, listening for these tractors. And of course, he's, he's lying to people. Mm -hmm. uh, he's telling them what he's going to force them to do. And this is referring to Stalin's forced agricultural collectivization that he did throughout Russia and the satellites of Russia, the Soviet Union, between 1929 and 1933. Right. And that, that was disastrous. I mean, it, it was, I think, the largest uh, famine in human history prior to uh, Mao. Right. And it was a largely engineered famine. Uh, uh -huh. And the Politburo's official line was that everything was fine, everybody was happy. And when it got so bad that 
even they could not deny the the massive death and loss of crops and creaturely life, all the animals that died as well. They started blaming it on a class of peasants who owned their own land. Um, they're, they're referred to as kulaks. And mm -hmm. so he also created a lot of class warfare at that time too. Uh, and this moment, it really does something destructive to our imaginations. Um, I'm sure you know the philosopher Hannah Arendt, and she has a great essay on lying in politics. And she's really concerned, as she often is, between this tension between contemplation and action and how we move toward action. And she says that our imaginations can't always hold everything. So we have to kind of move things or destroy things to make room for something new. And what a lie does is it, it's the bad kind of destruction. It does this thing which this poem is also trying to do. It erodes a sense of truth, a sense of reality. Um, and I'm wondering, could you read the next stanza here after the break? Yeah. And the horses were led into boxcars and emerged as the dimly remembered meals of flesh that fed the starving poles during that famine and part of the next one in which even words grew thin and transparent, like the pale wings of ants that flew out of the oldest houses. And slowly, what had been real in words began to be replaced by what was not real, by the not exactly real. Wow. What do you think of that? <laughs> Oh, I mean, it's so, um, so they're taking away the horses. Um, and these were the horses that in the past had um, been able to feed people during starving times, during famine, sort of the meat of last resort. Um, <clears throat> but they're, they're being, you know, taken away by Stalin. Um, and in this famine, without the horses to eat, even the words grew thin. So even yeah. the words are starving, um, and they're they're being they're starving because uh, they're being stripped of of reality. Is that kind of what's going on? I think so. I think that's a great reading of it. And what this portion of the poem does this is all one sentence everything that you read it's nine mm. lines but it's all one sentence so it sinuously wends its way from those horses who were flesh and went into boxcars to them being a meal to then words as you said starving and by the pile up of similes and then for those who might not be able to see this text Levis uses the ampersand a lot in this poem as well as the word and and that difference, what difference does it make to see the symbol versus the word itself? It's almost as if the word is getting starved down to its symbolic weight, um, it, its pure signification at this point. And so the poetry formally does this thing, which is so difficult for us as human beings. When somebody is telling you that your reality is not real, when somebody is telling you that what you're experiencing or what your loved ones are experiencing isn't that bad or just get over it, the ground opens up underneath you because how are you supposed to articulate what's real when that very category has been stripped from you? And the poem is showing us the terror of that in that one long kind of seductive sentence. So, uh, this is is this isn't the end of the poem, right? <laughs> no, it's not the <laughs> end of the poem. <laughs> is there is there any like hope or consolation here? Yes, yeah. Um, and how about could you read again uh, the part I have here before the break on the next slide? Uh, okay, yeah. So the death of Stalin and the slow, uninterrupted evolution of the horse a species no one, not even Stalin, could extinguish, almost as if what could not be altered was something noble in the look of its face, something incapable of treachery. Yeah. 
It's really hard for me to hear these lines and not get emotional. Yeah, have you I spent see, any time I mean, with put, horses? <laughs> I, I have I have not, but I mean, you put this image, I assume this is Larry Levis yeah. here with his dog. With his dog. And I, yeah. you know, I have spent time with dogs <laughs> and I think maybe something similar could be said of, of dogs and their faces, that there's something like they're incapable of treachery. Mm -hmm. Right. That noble in the look of its face, something incapable of treachery. That's a line to keep with you as a mantra, or at least I do. Um, mm -hmm. And this perseverance of the horse, a perseverance that is silent and witnessing. And this, I think, is the hopeful thing. You had asked me, is there hope? Is this where the mm -hmm. poem ends? If it's so tough for us in moments of trauma and chaos, like right now, to really mm -hmm. articulate our reality, what we need to do is witness to it. And we need people who will witness for us, who will say yes, who will affirm what is happening around us so that we can carry forth, we can evolve. Uh, I really like the way that horses are used metaphorically throughout this poem, but they're also very materially real. They have a biological history. They have evolved and even Stalin with all of his cruelty and his ego his perverse sentimentality could not destroy the horse. And if Stalin couldn't destroy a horse, then you have a chance to, uh, and somebody's out there witnessing for you. Um, and I wonder, you know, are you curious why the poem is called Anastasia and Sandman? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. My daughter's so name is Anastasia. It's a beautiful name. It's a beautiful name. And it also means resurrection. It does. Thank you. Yes, it does mean resurrection. So can I read the last stanza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, this is the true end of the poem. And besides, behind the angel hissing in its mist is a gate that leads only into another field, another outcropping of stones and withered grass, where a horse named Sandman and a horse named Anastasia used to stand at the fence and watch the traffic pass. Where there were outdoor concerts once in summer, under the missing and innumerable stars. Hmm. So they're horses. <laughs> uh, the, that's and literally it, what they are. Right. And it sounds like here we're not in Russia anymore. Right. Like we're in Larry Levis's town or something. And we are, in fact. Um, this poem and many poems from the collection are really situated in Central Valley, California. Mm -hmm. And these two horses, along with other horses, show up in other poems. Uh, and he's also, therefore, reliving parts of his childhood. And he brings in the plight of migrant workers. Uh, in many of his poems. So he's trying to weave together a sense of what his life once was, how history overlaps with that, to use a word that I know as a medievalist, you'll know the palimpsests of history, the layering and like looking down through things. Uh, he's bringing all of these things together in this poem. It's 110 lines uh, and it's magnificently paced, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah. so the um, so this is this is a memory mm -hmm. um, of uh, like of some like field of a farm where there were these horses that he knew, mm -hmm. um, and they used to stand at the fence and watch the traffic pass. So it's it's not like a it's kind of an urban farm mm -hmm. in a way. And then maybe at some point uh, the horses were no longer there and then there were outdoor concerts in that place. Right. Um, or maybe at the same time. Right. But they're not there anymore. The concerts are gone. The horses are gone. Even the stars uh, are now missing. Yes, yes. And I think that this goes all the way back to where we started uh, with this idea of belatedness and that when we 
look back, you know, in this, Walter Benjamin has this phrase, the angel of history with everything blowing back. We look back over this detritus of the past, we see this profound layering up of things. And I think that this idea of the past and memory, and we talked about repetition and trauma, but memory is also a part of trauma. I think it's really apt for Hopkins as well, if we could move on to that poem now too. Yeah, that would be great. Um... Okay, we're back from our coffee break here. And I have up on the slide for us the entirety of the poem, Carry and Comfort. It's 14 lines. I could put the whole thing there. And that guy on the left <laughs> is none other than Gerard Manley Hopkins looking so serious uh, with his hooded eyes. <laughs> That's how I always see him uh, with those hooded eyes. So um, how, how should we handle this? Because this is, Hopkins is dense um dense. this is a sonnet sonnets the you know even in even the easiest sonnets are complex uh you know tightly sprung machines yeah. uh right. so um and this this one especially is is difficult and and it's uh i think difficult it's wonderful to hear difficult to understand while hearing so like, could you just read it and we'll just bask in the sound of it first and then we can sure. dig into it? That's my favorite way to experience Hopkins. So yeah, I will read it and I'll try to really emph emphasize uh, the brutality of this. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Carry in comfort. Not. I'll not carry in comfort. Despair not feast on thee, not untwist, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary, cry, I can no more. I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be, but, ah, uh, but, Oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me, thy ring world, right foot rock? Lay a lion limb against me. Scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones. And fan, oh, in turns of tempest, me heaped here, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why, that my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear? Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since, seems, I kissed the rod, hand rather, my heart, lo, lapped strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me? Or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with my God, my God. Amazing wow. poem. Thanks. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. And, no, yeah. you, read it, you read it very well, too. Thanks. Oh, thank you. You know, I really think sometimes the sound is the meaning. I've taught this poem before, mm -hmm. and I get really into it in the classroom, <laughs> and then there's silence. And I think the desire is, mm -hmm. well, what, what, what was that about? lay a lion limb against me? What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. But it actually sounds beautiful. L is a, a voiced consonant, which means we have to use our vocal cords to make the sound, which is what we also do when we sing. So even though he seems to be describing here a, a paw of a lion swatting someone down, how lovely it is to say it. So 
the aural qualities of this poem reinforce, undermine, and frankly, give a kind of delight that is really hard to find mm -hmm. in the meaning of this poem. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, and and a uh, and a kind of terror. Yes, um, and <laughs> I think I, I think Hopkins is uh, kind of at his best when he's alliterating on R sounds. Yeah, <laughs> R sounds with some kind of hard consonant mixed in. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, but ah, but oh, thou terrible! Why wouldst thou rude on me, thy ring world right foot rock? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. What do you think a ring world right foot rock is? <laughs> well, it's very, it's very, very compressed, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so. Um, uh, so he's addressing something terrible, oh thou terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and why would you rude on me? I'm not sure exactly what how rude is being used as like a transitive verb there, but it's I think so, yeah. Uh, I guess it's be be rough to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, no, unleash roughly on me mm -hmm. your um, your right foot like a rock that rings that can ring the world like a uh, like a kitchen towel. Right. Yes. Is that how it's working? I think so. And notice how the syntax is so twisted. We really had to parse out, like think carefully about the placement of the words, the parts of speech, the grammar, right. all of that entanglement. If we go back up to that second line of the poem, not untwist, that's his statement of strength there, that he's not going to untwist slack they may be, mm. these last strands of man and me. There's something about being twisted up. And yeah, being and, bound. And this is very twisted up. And now as yeah. I look on it further, I'm realizing <laughs> rude is probably not a verb. <laughs> it's an adverb. Um, why would you rudely, and the Thou. verb here is rock. Why would you rudely um, rock your right foot on me, mm -hmm. your right foot that uh, can ring the world, W-R-I-N-G. Right. Right. And, you know, you had mentioned earlier about, is this about Jacob wrestling with the angel? Well, clearly there's a lot of wrestling here. Clearly he's alluding to the story. Gerard Manley Hopkins uh, was a Jesuit priest. He would have known that story, certainly. But that story of Jacob wrestling with the angel is almost too people, not people, one divine, one person coming together, but they're evenly matched in the biblical story. They wrestle together all night. One never really gets the better of the other. In this poem, you used also the word abject earlier. This yeah. speaker is abject. Yes. That, that's, uh, so lay a lion limb against me, scan. That line is in jam. Scan is the last word of that line. And in mm -hmm. jam, it means the, the sense carries over to the next line. So yeah. there's no punctuation there. And I love that moment because that word scan, it almost feels like some creature took a running leap off a precipice. And the white space there is the void over which it's flying. And mm. that thing is looking for you. <laughs> You're mm. the carrion. It's it's coming after there. It, it, mm -hmm. It's terrifying. It's a terrifying poem. <laughs> And I mean, I think what's also happening here is that um, Hopkins is identifying himself with his poem. So the last <laughs> strands of man that he describes, slack though they may be, not untwist the last strands of man, slack though they may be. Um, slack is uh, is a term that he uses in his own eccentric metrical system yep. um and uh and then here again scan so we have this kind of predator figure <laughs> scanning um 
scanning his bruised bones, but scanning is what uh, we do as readers of poetry when we try to analyze the metrics of of the poem. Exactly. Why? I'm so glad you. Why? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think this is really important. I'm so glad you brought up both Slack and Scan here. And no coincidence, they also have that s sound, which yeah. can be very soothing, but also harrowing, yeah. like a snake. And I think you know, some people think that going to poetry in times of crisis is escapism. I hope that we've already kind of revised that narrative. But I think sometimes people go to poetry because it might save their life. And sometimes poetry doesn't save your life. Sometimes poetry is the thing that is both drowning you and it's the only thing that you can hold on to, mm -hmm. to make sense. And when Hopkins himself became a Roman Catholic and was ordained a priest, he burned all of his earlier poetry. Writing poetry for him wasn't an ease of conscious, conscience, excuse me, it wasn't always a comfort, mm -hmm. and yet it was a compulsion. Mm -hmm. It was something that he had to do. And his poems weren't published during his lifetime, largely because he was inventing his own metrical systems. And this is a sonnet, as we said, but he's also known for what's called a curdle sonnet. He's, he took off two lines, basically, um, is mm -hmm. the easiest way to explain it. So it's not 14 lines. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was kind of uninterested in playing nice with the forms and yet using them to his own means and his what he required. Yeah, so um, so I guess I'm still wondering why is he <laughs> identifying himself with the poem? Um, right. Well, uh, I mean, and I, you know, because it's a sonnet, I, you know, I think we look for the answer um, in the last part of it. Right. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And he even, which even begins here. Why? So. Yeah the last right. six lines. Um, yeah, well. What, what is, so what's happening at the turn? Um, we've got the, um, the octet at the beginning and then we've got this, you know, a space, a gap, and mm -hmm. then it begins Y and we have the remaining six lines. Right, I think you're right. That turn, the volta there in the sonnet, it does kind of, bring us into a new relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think what's important here, look at all the questions. So it begins with the question, why? Mm -hmm. But then he says that he did these things so that the chaff, the parts of the grain that aren't suitable, might fly away. That, that God grain, did these things? That my chaff, that he chose to serve in this way, me frantic to avoid thee and flee, why? That my chaff might fly. Oh, might flee. So fly meaning flee. Right. That's how I'm reading away. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that the grain would lie sheer and clear. And then he seems to go be going back and forth in the toil and the coil. But then he comes to this point where he thinks there's going to be joy, but then he stops himself and he asks, cheer whom though? The hero whose heaven handling frung, flung me, foot trod me? Or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? And I don't know about you, but this is where I get confused every time in the poem because mm -hmm. there's several me's here mm -hmm. and there's several heroes or mm -hmm. whom's or that other that's giving the beating more often than not. And that question, is it each one? Is it each one at the same time? How is it possible to be a me that was beat and a me that fought? So there are only two actors here, mm -hmm. but there are like several subjects, like the action is split among several subjects. Uh, right. Or maybe, yeah, or maybe there are only or two subjects here, but there are several actors. Is that maybe the better way to put it? Yeah, or maybe even subject positions. Yeah, uh, because spatiality is really important in this right. poem. Who's who's on top? Who's on bottom? 
Yeah. Uh, and and what is their orientation? Mm-hmm. Right. So so what he's saying here is um, uh, so you know why why have I undergone this tempest, whatever whatever that was, whatever kind of um, harrowing experience he's he's been through. Um, I've undergone it so that um, the chaff in me, whatever whatever is extraneous, might be blown away. And what is left behind is my grain, the thing that really matters. Um, the, uh, and and it's and it's left sheer and clear. So it 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 now you know is um, uh, it's visible. Um, and uh, and and so um, in all of that toil, all of that tribulation before. Um, uh, here now has lays exposed like who i really am and and that's an occasion for joy right for cheer um and then he's like but wait who's it who is it supposed to cheer uh like what's left to who is left to cheer um am i am i supposed to to cheer on the the violent hero who's done this to me who's brutalized me um or am i supposed to cheer the me that fought against him uh right you know it like maybe maybe this isn't an occasion for cheer um or maybe i'm actually supposed to be cheering on each one and if so like then i'm cheering on the me who resisted him right right yeah there's something there's something very much like the Psalms in this poem Mm -hmm. where the the subject or the actors you were speaking of earlier, it shifts. And so it's hard to know sometimes where you are in the poem. Uh, And one thing that we often rely upon, I think, is a clear sense of self, who we are in any given moment Mm -hmm. of time. But what this poem does really dramatically is it says that that knowledge isn't always straightforward. And it doesn't always come down to us to determine who we are. And it also points to this really uncomfortable, and since God is mentioned in the last line of this poem, this uncomfortable relationship, why is it that I bind myself to that which hurts me? What is it about me or about this being that I'm serving that is both a hero and awesome and fascinating and terrifying and powerful and overwhelms me in a way that at times can be a source of joy, but at times can be a source of violent abjection. Mm-hmm. And I mean, mm-hmm. if we, uh, if I'm understanding the last line or so correctly, he's not speaking from, he's not writing this poem from within uh that time of trauma uh right. he's talking about it as a time past that night that like dark night of the soul that year of now done darkness when yeah. i lay wrestling with my god um this is this is another time that he's talking about and yet uh you know the way that he <laughs> that he's writing this poem and and identifying himself with the poem he's he's going back to it he's re-experiencing it um and it's belated but yeah so i guess i guess what's uh what's standing out to me here is not just that like uh we have poetry as a belated response to trauma because we're working things out but that, but that the poetry of trauma actually, if we if we actually didn't write it, you know, mm-hmm. we could just maybe move on or something like that. <laughs> but in in writing it and engaging with it, we're actually kind of binding ourselves to that time again. And why? Why? Right. Why would we do that? Well, I think it comes back to this idea of witnessing. There is something powerful and agential in being able to go back and look at that thing that traumatized you and speak back to it, even if it requires that kind of reliving, Mm -hmm. uh, 
this poem isn't whatever happened to Gerard Manley Hopkins. It's a poem, but he put it in a form in which you could look at it and engage in it. And that's, mm -hmm. for me, that's what lyric poetry does. It distends time. He's talking about something that's now past and done and, and over with that he is bringing into his present, this kind of extended continuous present of the moment of the poem, but that is also shuttling between a vision of the past and a vision of the future. Time is like a spiral here that we too are participating in. And I think that's why we go back and write it or paint it or make a movie about it because it gives us another language, um, even if it's a visual language, maybe especially if it's a visual language uh, to confront and to witness to the trauma. Yes. Okay, so this is really helpful for me because one of the things that, you know, I was as I was thinking about the dance of death and thinking about um, how, you know, any response to trauma always comes too late, uh, you know, what is the actual consolation? I was thinking like, okay, so we're in this very difficult time right now. Um, we're not going to be able to write the poetry of the coronavirus until the coronavirus is passed. So what's the point of actually, you know, thinking about the poetry uh, uh, right now? And, 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 and what, what you've just said makes me realize that you, you talked about like how uh, you said spiral. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, <laughs> What did you say about spiral? <laughs> yeah, the spiral of time. I mean, I think that that's pretty clear, Ryan, right? <laughs> no, just yes. Kidding. Yeah. No, exactly. The sp the, <laughs> so the spiral of time means that um, uh, that time is not um, a circle. It's not cyclical. We're not just repeating ourselves over and over again. But we are passing over similar territory with a difference. Um, and uh, and in this case in particular, like with the dance of death, we are passing over another time of pestilence. And um, and so part of the reason uh, that um, we make art in the aftermath of trauma, I mean, there is a therapeutic aspect to that as you've just expressed. Um, but I think a lot, part of the reason is that we make it because we know that that in the future we ourselves or other people will be in times of trauma again and uh and this is a place where we can meet yes. across history um across different times and we can actually inhabit that same space and by inhabiting the space of a poem like carrying comfort we're not only re-experiencing um, that trauma, but we also get to kind of proleptically, like in advance, experience a bit of the comfort, the hard-won comfort that Hopkins is achieving at the end of this poem, that Levis is achieving. Um, right, right. And if I might try to draw that all together with a term and an idea and a practice that I've spent a lot of time studying and writing about, we're trying to translate experience. You know, Lidgett, he translated from the French and that's how that poem begins, right? With a, mm -hmm. a note from the translator. And yeah. as I'm sure you know, translation, one of its earliest meanings was moving a dead body from one grave to another. And then it became something that we did with language too. Mm -hmm. So it's always had this material bodily connection as well as the, the linguistic, the language connection. And we're trying to translate our experiences, but we're also throwing that line out uh, to whoever needs it in a way that they can read it and understand and, and meet one another, as you so nicely put it. So as a Catholic Christian, I believe in the communion of the saints. I believe that we are... Um, uh, that we um, are in touch with and inhabit uh, the, you know, we, we kind of share and overlap with the, um, the living, those who are those, those souls who um, are living on. Uh, 
Um, and, and so that um, underwrites a very rich um, theology of prayer. Like we have a lot that we can, um, we, we have this sense that, you know, prayer is powerful and it's partly powerful because not only do we have um, all of our living friends and family and, and congregation praying with us and for us, but we also have the saints um, who are praying with us and for us. Uh, something similar is going on here in the way that you're describing um, what what poetry allows yeah i mean there's there's been a, a lot of writing about poetry and prayer and a lot of people use the idea of attention as the link between those two things that both poetry and prayer require a kind of attentiveness that uh, is mostly silent and that yields a form at the end of that silence but i would add on to that to say that if there is a link between poetry and prayer, that it also has something to do with memory and imagination. Of course, that seems obvious, but that imaginative gesture toward the future. We don't always recognize things when they happen to us. We can't always make sense of them. And that's true in traumatic moments. And that's true in moments that are ordinary. We don't always see things clearly. Uh, we see things as they pass by. There's a line in the Liebes poem that we didn't discuss something that disappears. Things are always disappearing, but we believe that they're there nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And so we can use something like poetry uh, and prayer, I think, to bring back, to remember all of those things that passed and hope for a time when we really are remembered in love. That's consoling. I think. I hope so. It consoles me. Mm -hmm. I think about my grandparents at this time. I still have my one grandma who are trying really hard to keep safe right now. Mm -hmm. But I, I think about my paternal grandparents and my maternal grandfather that I have to see them again. Yeah. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Elise. Thank you. This Ryan. is a good place to to wrap up. Yeah. That was really. Um, I'm glad for this time because we are. I think a lot of people are being more deliberate about conversations like this, and mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have had this conversation otherwise. I know. I'm grateful for it. That is a real silver lining. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see you. Good Me to too. talk, and yes. I look forward to seeing you in person sooner hopefully rather than later i know i i really hope so let's get a beer sometime soon <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds good okay okay bye all right bye ryan thanks for watching if you appreciated this episode please click that like button and subscribe to our channel and leave a comment we love to hear from listeners. Chat with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And if you are a university student or faculty member in Pittsburgh and would like to be involved locally, check out our fellows programs and get in touch. This episode was mixed and mastered by Yellow Music and Sound. Until next time, I'm Ryan McDermott. Go with God. <laughs>